there was a, well, I'm black. Um, there was, you know, everyday language. You know, the various dialects, many people think of Prakrit as uh, a common tongue. So the idea was that Sanskrit is maximum meaning with minimum words. The same word can have many, many suggestive meanings. So you can take the same passage of a scripture and it can have layers of meaning depending on how you want to translate particular words. That's why with a text like the Bhagavad Gita, there are various different approaches to what it actually means. Um, so we are in a tradition called Advaita Vedanta, which means it's, it's non-dual. What's the non-dual mean? So the three great Semitic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are monotheistic as one God. Advaita Vedanta is not monotheistic. It's monistic. What's the difference between monotheism and monism? Monotheism says there's one God. Monism says there's only God. There's no otherness. And so this is an idea that we've been working on in Gita. What we see as the phenomenal world is not material in the way we normally think of it. It comes about in the same way your dream does. I like to say you are the god of your dream. So, um, anybody have a dream this past week? I had one. I shared a couple of the classes. I was in my old roommate Perry's 56 Packer. Most of you haven't even seen a 56 Packer. That's a car. I'm sitting in the passenger seat. He was off trying to get something in a store. And the car, the engine was shut off and it was in neutral. And if you've ever had a stick shift and you've had it in neutral with the emergency brake on, sometimes it doesn't hold. You ever had that happen? The car was starting to roll backward and I was trying to get over into the driver's seat, find the keys, to turn the car on so I could put it in gear and move it forward Then I woke up. So in the dream, I had a dream body and there was a dream world of stuff people, places, things, and conditions. Inside, there were dream feelings and thoughts. In that sense, the experience is no different than what we're having right now. So it is imagination that creates this world. Now, the big difference is you are not the God of this world. God is the God of this world. You are the God of your dream. God is not deluded. You and I are in the dream state unless you're having a lucid dream. It's a hard idea for people just being introduced to this work to grasp. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, all this phenomenal world. It's nothing but Brahma. Now, the idea that we were dealing with last week is what happens to people when they die. And we had a little bit of an understanding of what I call spiritual anthropology. So what yoga says is we have a material sense of body. Technical term is stula sharira. 
which literally means gross body. Gross here doesn't mean, ew, gross. <laughs> it means a denser vibration, like the low notes on a piano were grosser than the high notes. Those are subtle. We have, as it were, a subtler body, a sukshma sharira. That's the body we run around in the dream state. Or if you ever have an out of the body experience, what is it that goes out of the body? That's your subtle body. If you've ever known anybody who's had a near death experience, anybody themselves had a near death experience or know someone who has? So describe what they experienced. Oh, I never asked her about the details, unfortunately. Oh, Sorry. most people, one of the most common things is they're usually above the physical body. How did she almost die? Like drowning or an accident or what? I wish I had asked. I'm sorry. Yeah. But let's just say, you know, someone, their heart stops on, on the operating table. Next thing you know, they pop out of the physical body. They're looking it down. They see the doctors there with the paddles. All the bodies jumping. And then all of a sudden, their heart starts up. And all of a sudden, wham, they're back in the body. So what was it that was hanging out on the sea looking at that? Subtle body. Some people do what the Westerners call astral projection. They gain control over the subtle body in the dream state, and they'll actually go to places and, you know, spy on their friends. <laughs> I saw you in bed with so and so. <gasps> How did you know about that? <laughs> <laughs> what body is it that does that? That's your subtle body. Now, when you die, subtle body comes out of the physical body and it goes to what we call a loka loka means world or people so in christianity you've got heaven you've got hell if you're catholic you've got purgatory you used to have limbo i don't know what the lutherans have that's probably um, the same as christian yeah that, Hindus have a lot more places you can go. It's much richer. And they're all temporary. So you go into one of these lokas. We get actually the word location or the Latin word locus from the same Sanskrit root. So the subtle body hangs out there for a while and then uh, it resolves the unresolved issues from that particular lifetime and then impelled by its desires and for experience and sensation, you're born again. So yoga posits this idea of reincarnation. Krishna says, certain is death for the born, and certain is birth for the dead. You are not the subtle body. The subtle body, like the physical body, is fundamentally inert. It's not sentient. Sentience illumines it. You are something independent of both the physical body and the subtle body. You are never born. You cannot die. You don't go anywhere. Just like your dream body. Do you incarnate into your dream? Or to use the language Krishna used in the seventh chapter, I am not in them. They are in me. Isn't the dream in you? 
feels like I'm in it. It feels like I'm in the body, peeping out. Isn't that our experience in the dream? But that's not really what's going on. I'm in my damn bed. And the dream is in my mind. So yoga thunders. But this physical body, the stula sharira, and the subtle body, the sukshma sharira, sometimes called the linga sharira, is that a term maybe you two have heard? Or the antakarana, inner equipment. You are not that. Very gross example. The glass is like the gross body. The water in the glass is like the subtle body. Reincarnation is if I break the glass, I can pour the water into another glass. But you are like the space in the glass. Magic trick. You see the space in the glass there? Watch it closely. Did I move space? In fact, was there really space in the glass? Or was the glass in space? So whatever happens to your physical body or the subtle body, neither of them touch you. That's the goal of the work we're doing is to find out who we are, to identify the birthless, changeless self. Now, in the verses we've just ended, Arjuna is asked, what happens when we die? And Krishna basically says, whatever your mind is focused on at the moment of death, that's where you go. Now, most people have a naive understanding of it. I always think of some gal, she's lived really good life, has a yogini, good person, death is approaching, she's there in the hospital bed. And a really good looking nurse comes in and he's a stud. <laughs> and she goes, Ooh, on her deathbed. Does that mean she's going to come back, you know, as some hussy, you know, wild <laughs> for sex and stuff like that? No. You build the thoughts at the time of death through a lifetime. unconscious throws this stuff up and it happens in that liminal place between birth or between death and on the other side. Don't worry about it. What we're far more concerned about, you build that moment action by action Thought by thought. And I talked about this last week, but I want to repeat it because it's so important. Years and years and years ago, I was asked to give a presentation on Vedanta at this group called Q Spirit in the city. I had no idea what I said, and it wasn't important. But one of the of their uh, workshops or programs, there was a panel of half a dozen people, all of whom had had near-death experiences. They didn't talk to one another, 
Each one went down the row talking about what happened. Almost identical. Popped out of the body. Sukshma Sharira, seeing the Stula Sharira. Then there was a tunnel. You may have read stuff like this mm -hmm. in the inquiry. Mm -hmm. Some people had beings come that they did not know. Others had family members come. And then they had, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And they were judged in the presence of the light. And it's not, you were bad, you stole carrots as a child anything like that. It was what simple acts of real love and concern did you do? Did you sit with someone who was in great suffering? Did you help a beggar. So everything they thought was important, education, prestige, money, house, in the presence of the light, meaningless, unimportant. How did you love? I tend to believe them. That's what is important. Now, Michael, the Master Jesus, said the same damn thing, didn't he? Yes. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. And the disciples said, Master, when were you hungry? Why did I give you a glass of water? He said, whenever you have done this to the least of my people, you have done it unto me. Very famous part of the Christian life. Very true. So my point is, this is the kind of action and thinking and priorities you want to cultivate, which will determine what happens at the moment of death. All right, with this in mind, Deepa G, would you please help us out with the next verse? Anybody know what verse we're on? I think we're on six. On six. Yum yum vapi smaran bhavam. Yadyante kalevaram. Tamta me vaiti kaunteya. Tada tad pava bhavitaha. Whosoever at the end leaves the body thinking of any being. To that being only he goes, O Kantea, because of his constant thought of that being. So again, what impels us into a particular loka and then ultimately into the next incarnation is where is my priority? Now, he said in a previous verse, those who think of the devas go to the devas, those who think of me come to me. The word deva here, we can translate as demigod, but actually a better way to look at it is the presiding principle over a field of human endeavor. It could be making lots of money, it could be getting a lot of prestige. It could be falling passionately in love. It could be being a famous guru. All of these 
are based on the idea, this is what I think is good. So what I like to say, you take the word God, G-O-D, insert an extra O. So you have G-O-O-D. What is my good? I may go to church on Sunday. I may do puja on holidays. But if I think money, property, prestige, the approval of others, having good looks, being important, if that's my good, that's my God. And if I spend my life in that, that's what impels me into that life. The next time. So a bunch of us um, are going to be doing this wonderful text called The Essence of Yoga Vasishta. And I'm doing it with one student right now. We have the story of Leela. Leela means play. So it's all kind of a thing on her name. But part of the story, there's this poor Brahmin by the name of Vasishtha. Of course, that's a joke because Vasishtha is the dude who wrote the book. He's there in his house, probably full of self-pity because he's a very noble Brahmin and broke. looks out the window. Brahmin, by the way, is the highest social class, the priest class. So in India, you can have very high status and be broke. The closest thing we could have that would be comparable is in this day and age, people who were, whose families were aristocratic in Europe. My father was the Baron Schmerin. What do you do for a living? I work for the post office happens but you're going to be a poor Brahmin is the point so he looks out and he sees the king go by with all his jewels and silk and 20 wives and powerful horse and it crosses his mind as oh it would have been so much better if I'd been a king so the story goes on and then he gets reincarnated as a king. And then they go through all sorts of things, illustrating what it is. Now, you don't have to believe in reincarnation to get great value from this. Those of us who've been involved in 12-step traditions, that's like AA or NA or Al-Anon, stuff like that. We have a term called a geographic. A geographic is when, oh, where I am sucks, so it's going to be better if I move. So I'm in Chicago and I've alienated all my friends and I'm gonna lose my job and I've run up my credit cards and I'm about ready to be evicted. Chicago is just brutal. It's going to be so much better if I go to Los Angeles. People are different there. But you move to Los Angeles, and guess what happens? In a year or two, you've alienated all your friends. You're pissed at your boss. You can't pay your rent. And you've messed up your credit again. Ugh, everything is so plastic in Los Angeles. I'm going to move to Sebastopol out in the country. You see the logic of this? Any of us done anything like that? <laughs> and the problem is, wherever you go, you take your mind with you. You don't leave it behind. So a spiritual geographic is, it would have been better 
if I'd been a sumo wrestler. It would have been better if I'd been born in Africa. It would be better if I had been born in a rich family and had lots of money. Or, oh, my family, they're so unhappy. Money is all they think about. It would have been so much better if I'd been born as a poor, simple person. But in this life, we go from place to place, relationship to relationship, job to job, being convinced I'll be happy in a different place doing different stuff with different people. I'll be happy when it'll be better if. So you don't have to believe in the doctrine of reincarnation. If you think what's wrong with your life is circumstantial, you're probably seriously deluded. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come here one-on-one, -on -one, sit on the couch, and, oh, I can't stand my job, and especially my boss. My boss is just awful. Blah, 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 blah. Well, how do you feel? Well, they're, I can't do what I really want, and they're critical all the time, and they're just a terrible manager. And then the, what's the next question I ask? Tell me this is the first time you've had this feeling. They can't all be asshole bosses. If you meet one asshole, bad luck. If you meet two coincidence. If you meet three, guess who's the asshole? <laughs> So the yogi can reincarnate. The ordinary person, I should put it that way, in one circumstance to another, thinking, that's my good. That's my good. Any thoughts on this? So the flip side of this, you've heard me say this hundreds of times, it's a spiritual axiom that if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the spiritual problem. I'm the one with the attachment. I'm the one with the expectation. I'm the one with the identification. And if I think that the way to be, get peace of mind, to be happy, is out there to get what I want, really young people can live in that delusion. But you know, if you're over 30, 35, what I say is, how did that work out for you? And work because the disquiet is inside, it's never outside. And there's a very famous saying from uh, Yoga Vasishta why try to cover the world, the earth, in leather when you can wear shoes? So what as yogis we want to do is find peace within myself. Then I'm at peace anywhere. Home, job, school, career, relationship. A question. Please. Yeah, what's the, what's the root cause of the disturbance? Spiritual ignorance. 
deep spiritual ignorance. I do not know who I am, so I have false ideas of identity. And two, I have no idea where happiness really is. I think it's out there. So I have to solve that problem. When I find out who I am, and I find out what the world is, and I find out that the mind, free from attachment, free from craving, free from longing, when it comes home, it's at peace. And then you're at peace anywhere. But wouldn't that disturbance already start, you know, at a very young age? Uh, it actually is beginningless. We're born into it. All right. Thank you. Excellent question. I don't see very well. Who is it who asked that? Uh, Peter. Peter. Okay. Now I'm getting to know nope. you better. Okay. Thank you. Great. Great question. Please ask questions. Anytime. All right. Any other thoughts on this idea? It, 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 go ahead. Well, so to break the cycle then is to do it through spiritual study. How do you go about breaking that cycle? The, it, this is going to be hard. Shankara says, without knowledge of the self, study of the scriptures is futile. Because you're going to get lost misunderstand, all that kind of stuff. With knowledge of the self, study of the scriptures is again futile. You don't need it. So what is the purpose of the scripture? It serves as a bridge for a person of wisdom, meaning only they've, they've traveled the path. They can say, yep, it works. This doesn't work, that does work. And they can transmit this understanding, this deep experience to another. So it's not just study like you'd be studying for, say, the MCAT. It's not about the acquisition of data. It's a different kind of knowledge than that. I don't know if that's helpful. How do you get that knowledge? That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> the root cause of liberation is association with the wise. That's why in Indian culture, The most powerful of all relationships is the Guru Shishya relationship. Now, many people in India, they say, My Guru is Swami Chinmayananda. My Guru is Shirdi Sai Baba. Isn't that your family Guru? Oh my. Yeah. The problem with a Guru who's not in the body, or even one that you only see like once every five years, is there's no relationship. It's, it's not much different than in the Christian church having a relationship with a, a, a saint, Saint Anthony, or the Blessed Virgin Mary, even Jesus. It's very different than when you have a relationship with another human being who loves you, who wants nothing from you, whose only joy with you is your own happiness and unfolding. Those relationships are rare. It's what I had with him. You can get a lot by reading scripture with a good commentary, but that'll get you started. Swamiji said you really only need two books, the Bhagavad Gita with a good commentary, 
is I think is very good. I'm quite partial to it, but there are others. And Viveka Chudamani by Shankar, because that sets out what you are to do in a systematic way. But it's not just reading it, you gotta do what they say. I don't know if, because uh, you're a scientist, so, and you you teach right now, don't you? Don't you teach math? Yeah, uh, science. But have you ever had kids who um, they hear the principle? I'm, I'm a, it's a lot clearer with math. So you're teaching a math class, and the kids don't do the homework. They may have a passive understanding of the principle. <coughs> but they haven't really, you know, gone through how to do the equations and do the work. Have you ever had that happen with kids? Yeah, what happens? How do they do on the tests usually? Not too well. Yeah. They know it, but they can't apply it. Yes, you got it by George. She's got it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat that, what she said? They know it, but they can't apply it. Mm. So again, in Viveka Chudamani, the book we just talked about, one of the things Shankara says, that person who is medha, who can tell me what medha means? A keen memory. The exoteric understanding is you're able to memorize verses of scripture. But the deeper meaning is you can apply the principle in the life situation when it comes up. They know it, but they don't apply it. And to remember to apply it is medha. Very good. Is that helpful? All right, next verse. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanusmara yudhyacha mayar putta mano buddhir mame vaishyasya samshayam. Therefore, at all times, remember me and fight. With mind and intellect fixed or absorbed in me, you shall doubtless come to me alone. Yes. So, again, over and over again, Krishna says to Arjuna, Krishna is a pre-Christian Christ figure. We can just call him that. Divine incarnation of God. So just think of him like that. And he's talking to this dude, Arjuna, who's a warrior. So what makes this book so interesting is it, it's about a, a fratricidal civil war. It takes place in India thousands of years ago. But the fighting is a metaphor for you and I dealing with the vicissitudes of life. Our families, our jobs our politics, our finances, all those things. So here Krishna says, this is the attitude you want to have. Who do you work for, Ashani? For an interior designer. No, you don't. You work for God. Who do you work for? God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have students. Are some of them smart and some of them dumb and you really aren't too interested in them? No. <laughs> You're a better teacher than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you teaching? Krishna. See, every one of them is God. When you're at the market and the clerk is checking out your groceries, 
who's checking out your groceries? God. There was a person and he was either mentally ill or high on some drugs and he was downstairs. I had lunch downstairs at the Chisos today with my neighbors. He was like spitting on people and being really loud and kind of threatening and stuff like that. Even he is God. So our job here in a very real sense is to remind ourselves that every person, every situation, every interaction, every dynamic in our lives is God. We try to keep that foremost in my mind. Let me see if I can give you an example. So I was talking with a particular person who is deeply involved in animal rights. She believes really, really strongly in this. And she ran into someone on the street and she was uh, frightened by them. She's not a big woman. And uh, this was a very threatening person. Now, what kind of attitude? And I asked her, if you were walking down the sidewalk on Grand Avenue and someone had a dog chained to one of the parking meters, and as you went by, at you. Did you think the dog was evil? She said, of course not. It was just doing its dog thing. But she loves animals. So at some deep level, she can let the dog be the dog without judging it. I'm thinking it ought to be different than it is. Do you catch the taste of this? With other people, threatening people in our lives, political figures that don't do what we want. Sometimes it's very hard. Human beings can do some things that are really horrible to one another. deep inside every one of us is the divine. With that in mind, would you read the English of that verse again, please, Deepa? Nice and loud. Sure. Therefore, at all times, remember me and fight with mind and intellect fixed or absorbed in me you shall doubtless come to me alone. So we fight, meaning we engage in the interactions of life. Go to work, deal with your family, deal with your relationships, shop, do laundry, do the dishes. Do what you can to remember the infinite and remember that it's all God. Any thoughts on this? Michael, in the Christian tradition, there's a very famous book written by a fellow named Brother Lawrence, and it's called The Practice of the Presence. Are you familiar with it at all? No, no. So in it, it's very short. His entire practice, he was a monastic, he was a monk. He said, how would you act? How would you think? How would you behave if the Master Jesus were right next to you? 
the wonderful practice. You go into a, a, a board meeting. What if the master were right there next to you? You go into school. What if Shirdi Sai Baba were right there behind you? How would you teach? Lovingly. Hmm? Lovingly. Yeah. All sorts of tricks we can use to try to remember. When Moses is up on top of Mount Sinai in the presence of Yahweh, of God, who's in the burning bush, God says, take off your shoes because the place whereon you stand is holy ground. So many of us think, oh, I've got to take my shoes off when I go into the temple. But Right where you stand is holy ground because you are standing there. You are a divine incarnation of God. If you remember it. Doesn't mean, oh, I'm a powerful person, look at me. But there's lots of implication. Again, going back to things the Master Jesus said. He said, my father always hears me because I do his will. So you can be a Christian yogi, Michael. One of the things we want to do is we look at the Master Jesus, not as the great exception but as the great example, he shows us what it is to be fully human. Follow me. He says that over and over and over again. Not worship me. Follow me. I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. All right, next verse. Abhyasa yoga yuktena chetasa nanya gamina paramam purusham divyam yat yati partha nu chintayan with the mind not moving towards any other be any other thing made steadfast by the method of habitual meditation and constantly meditating on the supreme purusha the resplendent O Partha, he goes to him. Yes. So, if you have a daily practice, Abhyasa Yoga, Abhyasa means practice. A daily, regular practice. A yogi goes to him. So, if you have a life rooted in this knowledge, rooted in this practice at the moment of death, you will go to Krishna. But there's a deeper meaning of this verse. This verse is about self-realization and meditation. So in your meditation see, withdrawing your mind from the phenomenal world, Practicing yoga. Yoga means union. We yoke the mind to the self. When I let go of all the counterfeit identifications, the phony self, the egoistic self, I've let go of all the attachments. Let go of all my concerns for people, places, things, and conditions. All. Oh. The 
mind becomes still. comes to me. Remember when Krishna says to me, he means yourself. So always when we talk about this at the moment of death, Deeper understanding is at the moment of the death of the phony self, the counterfeit self, the shadow self. If you read St. Paul, Michael, one of his greatest images is to die with Christ, to be resurrected with he says, I die daily. In ancient Christianity, there was always the association of the baptismal font with the tomb. You go down into the water, like going down to death, and you rise up. The deeper meaning of this is the abandonment of the small self, the self-forgetting, where the mind commits psychic suicide, you get, oh, that counterfeit self, that shadow self, that personal sense of self. It's not real comes and it goes, but behind that, there's something that's very real. Next one. Kavim Purana. Little louder, please. Uh, is this better, Jim? Yes. Kavim Purana Manusha Sitaram Ano Aro Ano Raniyam Samanus Maritya Sarvasya Dhatar Machintya Rupam Aditya Varnam Tamasa Parastat. Whosoever meditates upon the omniscient, the ancient, the ruler of the whole world, minuter than the atom, the supporter of all, of form inconceivable, effulgent like the sun, and beyond the darkness of ignorance. So, in the literature, we have verses that are meditations of negation and verses that are meditations of assertion. We sum all the meditations of negation into what we say, neti neti, na iti, na iti, not this, not this. We did a meditation like that when I had did the guided meditation. I am not the body, I'm not the prana, I'm not the manas, I'm not the buddhi. Then we have these assertion meditations. This is not like doing affirmations. I am Brahman, I am Brahman, I am Brahman. No. What we want to do is use each one of these ideas. And with the attention introverted, the mind made very quiet, see whether or not it's true 
about you. So let's go through each one of these ideas. So what was the first idea, Deepa? Whosoever meditates upon the omniscient. Omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. So here omniscience means what is that in me that knows everything? Who sees the phone? I do. Who sees the lamp? I do. Who hears the traffic? I do. Who knows the body? I do. Who knows the feelings? I do. Who knows the thoughts? I do. Who knows the waking state? I do. Who knows the dream state? I do. Who knows the past? I do. Who knows the present? I do. If I make it into the future, who's going to know the future? Me. Who is the knower in all things? That's the deep meaning of omniscient. <laughs> Next idea. Ancient. Ah, and is it Puranam or Sanatanam? Which one does he use? I didn't, can't remember now. Puranam. Yes. Ancient. Means really, really old. So, what was that which was the awareness, the ground of being, that was the context for the creation of the whole world. What was there before the Big Bang? Now I'm riffing on some Christian stuff, stuff because Michael is here. Um, and tell me if your parents were not religious and you never really went to church. Is that what happened? Oh, no, no, very, very religious. Okay, so this is stuff you know. <laughs> yeah. All right, so in the Catholic Church, Every year at Easter, the first reading that we do is the story of creation in Genesis. Do they do that in the Lutheran church? No. no. Okay, but you know the story. Yes. So in the beginning, the world was formless. There was nothing there. And it's very interesting. In the Hebrew Bible, it says, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Or sometimes it'll say darkness was on the face of the waters. What's your mother tongue? What, what, what language did you speak in your, your home as, as, chill, as a child? Uh, English. English, okay. So they have that, but you know, it may be slightly different. So this means water, the deep, was there before creation. Huh? So it says in the Bible. So the mystical meaning of it, water is the great Western metaphor for consciousness. Consciousness was there before God said, let there be light, fiat books. So Vedantic. So Vedantic. But now, Let's go to your own direct experience. Oh, Jim, I think I was about 12 when I started to have a self. Before that, no self. That's not our experience. 
When were you ever not you? Listen very carefully. If you look at a photograph of yourself at three or at seven or at 12, that body is gone. That's not what has been continuous and ancient through your life. So it's my memory that ties it all together, Jim. Is it? What is today? 27th? 27th of June? Yeah. What were you doing on the 27th of June five years ago? What were you doing on the 26th of June 10 years ago? Any idea? You have no memory of them. There are huge gaps in your memory. Did you disappear on those days? No. If you have elders in your family and you put on music from their childhood, Ever had a grandparent get up and start to dance and stuff like that, just like they did as teenagers? Anybody seen their parents do that? Grandparents do that? Yes. Why? Because inside that wrinkly old body with the creaks and the groans, you don't feel any different. Yourself is aged. Think as you sit there, you just check out yourself. Are you different than you were 10 years ago? Your body's different. You may have different beliefs and attitudes, but you are you. Next idea. The ruler of the whole world. Yes. So it is the self, which is the life principle that enlivens everything. Consciousness has the potentiality for all manifestation to happen. There's no other director, ruler. Next idea. Minuter than the atom. Yes, how big are you? In your meditation, when you go inside, sometimes it feels like I'm a point from which I look out. Sometimes it seems like on this vast empty space. But minuter here also means subtler. I pervade everything. Consciousness pervades everything, just like you pervade everything in your dream. Next idea. The supporter of all. Yes. Consciousness is the ultimate support of everything. Even the physicists are starting to come to this. That the universe exists in a conscious medium. Vijnana Dhanam, a homogeneous mass of sentience. Next idea. Of form inconceivable. Yes. What do you look like? Not your body. So you are without a form. Nirupaham, 
beyond without any form. <coughs> Nothing there. Yet that no thingness shines as I, I, I. Next idea. Effulgent like the sun and beyond the darkness of ignorance. Yes. So I am a conscious sentient being. Have this idea that the self is swayam jyoti, self luminous. Not only am I that which lights everything, I know it all, but I need no other light to illumine me. I am self evident. How do you know you are you? You don't see, hear, taste, touch, or smell yourself. You don't vote yourself. You don't think yourself. Yet you know you are. And beyond the darkness of ignorance. I, this crazy guy that I was downstairs, if I could get him to talk, we might have had a conscious a conversation like, how are you doing? Oh, terrible. <laughs> Do you exist? Of course I exist. What's your existence? Terrible. Are you a conscious being? Yeah. What are you conscious of? Misery. So he still thunders. I am. I know. I shine as awareness. Even though in the mind covered by deep ignorance, he did not. Is that the end of this verse? Yes. Okay, we're a little over. We'll stop here tonight. I'll hang out a little bit afterwards so we can uh, have some questions if need be. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Namaha Hari Om That's just another prayer that we do at the end, Michael. Thank you all. Anybody have questions, comments? Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, people.